Hello my friends, this is Sarah from Weird Horizon and thank you for joining me again as we continue our series on cryptozoology. Focusing on the theories surrounding Yeti, Bigfoot, Sasquatch and other large hairy bipedal primates, generally referred to by those attempting to prove their physical existence as anomalous primates. That is, of course, not the only name by which many of these creatures are referred to. The naming of the creatures often says something about the context in which they are being discussed, and it's these various contexts that we are going to be looking at in the coming few weeks. So we are going to approach the subject of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, and the like through the viewpoint of the scientists and explorers who sought physical evidence for their existence and attempted to situate them in our accepted biological, evolutionary, genealogical and zoological systems. We will then move on in coming weeks to the theories around the creature's existence as being a deliberate or widespread hoax, or some kind of psychological symptom, before concluding with some of the more spiritual and faith-based ideas around the creature's. So this episode in particular was greatly informed by two works, the previously mentioned Searching for Sasquatch, Crackpots, Eggheads and Cryptozoology by Brian Regal, which concentrates on the evolution of the scientific field of cryptozoology and anomalous primates. And also the book The Locals, a contemporary investigation of the Bigfoot slash Sasquatch phenomenon by Tom Powell. Powell writes about his experiences as curator for the account submitted to the Bigfoot Field Research Organization's website, whose name I absolutely mangled last week. I am very sorry. And BFRO's attempts at providing proof despite the wealth of accounts received and just the difficulties at providing tangible scientific evidence for their existence. And you'll hear about the difficulties as we go on. So I'm also in greatly enjoyed in my research, Professor of Anatomy and Anthropology Jeff Meldrum's analysis of the infamous Patterson-Gimlin film and the associated print casts. So he did a talk on the matter which is available on YouTube and I will make a link available for those who would like to watch it in my show notes. Meldrum applies his own theories to the study of the prints and gives some very convincing evidence, at least in my opinion, for how the prints would be difficult, if not downright impossible to fake, by anyone other, and this is my conclusion entirely, than an experienced anthropologist or primatologist. And I don't think that idea of them being potentially, at least in some cases, faked by an anthropologist or primatologist is entirely out of the question, and you will see why. Nor do I want to discount all evidence for Bigfoot. I just think it's an interesting angle to approach it from. But let's start at the beginning, in my opinion and in Regal's opinion, with the loose field that many would react against to form the sort of Sasquatch research effort as we know it as today, the early efforts to capture the Yeti. So, Ignoring its more ancient and folkloric aspects just for the moment, mentions of the Yeti began to appear in Western literature around the 1830s. So rumours began to circulate in Britain in 1832 when a diplomat sent back an account of the wild man of Nepal who would run with incredible speed to hide in mountain caves. But these didn't really make much of a splash outside of the mountaineering community. But soon more and more mountaineers began to report spotting strange tracks in the snow and humanoid figures moving in the distance as part of the Western attempt to scale the Himalayas to be the first people to mount a successful expedition to the peak of Mount Everest. More and more these mountaineers, their local guides might clue them into some of the local legends and myths um, around the creatures that they were seeing. So their sightings were very much the side effect of their mountaineering, but slowly these stories began to be associated with it. 
nobody was setting off to Tibet or Nepal in search of the Yeti yet. It wasn't the Yeti that generated popular interest in Nepal and Tibet at that time, rather it was the other way around. As author Peter Bishop in his book The Myth of Shangri-La, Tibet's travel writing and the Western creation of sacred landscape argues that, and as Regal summarises, the Yeti became popular because Western enthusiasts of the East made the region of Nepal and Tibet into a fantasy land in their minds. The actual people meant little. Western authors turned the landscape into a paradise of spiritual awakenings for themselves. And in a really quite interesting Daily Mail article on their own Yeti hunting trip, they lament the sort of spurious motivations for the early Yeti hunting craze and their hand in it. So I quote, Newspapers embellished tales of hairy murderers, and the Yeti and its habitat entered the imagination of Conan Doyle, Jules Verne, and of course, Herge's Tintin. Tibet was a kind of remote realm where monks practiced levitation and clairvoyance. It was a never-never land. And so the entire area became associated in Western minds with fantasy, mystery, and unbounded spiritual possibility. It seems like there was no auspicious reason that the Yeti should make an appearance at this point. You couldn't really describe it as an attempt to make some kind of contact. More that the Western explorers were visiting Nepal for their own spiritual reasons and stumbled across something else to support their own view of the area as mysterious and different, i.e. the Yeti. According to Sherpa legend, the Yeti is a genus of high-altitude dwelling, ape-like creatures with three distinct species. A six to eight foot bear-like creature covered in either blonde, red, black or grey fur. They have been known to deploy long claws in the hunting of cattle. Secondly, a two-legged creature the size of a small man, covered in black or red hair with a long mane hanging over its eyes. And finally, a sad-faced, dwarf-sized beast found in the dense forests below 10,000 feet. And with renewed interest in the region by Western audiences came interest in these legends. But it is telling that the popular name for the creature, a mangling of the Sherpa name for the being, the name Abominable Snowman, that was the name that captured the imagination, being a word pronounceable to English tongues and feeding into the idea of the region as being host to strange and exotic creatures. It was mountaineer Charles K. Howard Berry in 1920 who led the expedition to Nepal where he first cabled his incident with the snowman back to be picked up by journalist Henry Newman. A soldier, explorer, intelligence officer and botanist, Charles had travelled extensively through Asia with his pet bear, Nagu, and kept a diary of his journeys, which is to this day in private ownership. He described on his trip seeing several men-like creatures from a distance. His history with Tibet and Nepal was not uncomplicated. In 1905, he was said to have travelled into Tibet without permission, and the same year of his famous sighting, 1920, was in the process of persuading the Dalai Lama to allow Westerners to approach Everest. Howard Berry sought to throw the lid open to these parts of the world that for various reasons, political and religious, were not fully accessible to Westerners. The local legend, which until now has only known to the local people and the mountaineers they occasionally shared their legends with, was now an international celebrity and successive expeditions would continue to keep an eye out for the elusive Yeti. Needless to say, but I'll say it anyway, but the Yeti got entangled with this exoticizing narrative created by and for the Westerners. It's the kind of narrative that consistently simplifies and others entire cultures for one's own need 
spiritual awakening in this case, conquest, the discovery of new lands already inhabited but presented to a Western audience for entertainment. It all reads to our modern eyes as a bit gross, um, but that might be why the description of the creature as man-like is so key to where the story goes from now on. This description and supposition would form the motivation for the next wave of explorers. Less interested in the Himalayan region as a spiritual site, these mostly American and Europeans would pivot their reasons for being there from adventure to the possibility that they were furthering valuable research into bipedal hominids as yet undiscovered. As mentioned, mountaineer Eric Shipton would present the first physical evidence of the creatures to the world with the publication of the footprints he photographed in 1951 in the Himalayan mountains. Found while seeking an alternative route up to Mount Everest, the prints struck Shipton as potentially hominid. Born to British parents, Shipton was one of the most highly respected Everest explorers and continued the national interest in the region caused by the British Great Trigonometric Survey, which had deduced Everest to be the tallest spot on Earth. The peak was entirely unconquered, at least by Westerners, and seemed to prevent a kind of peak through a door that was rapidly closing, the weakening idea of there being unexplored lands on Earth to be discovered and conquered. Shipton's photograph seemed to show a long string of prints of a bipedal creature walking along unhindered by the freezing winds and high elevation, a feat that he deemed impossible even to seasoned climbers such as himself and his crew. And interest in the images and the crew only peaked further when members of the same crew were the first documented climbers to reach the peak of Everest in 1953. Although if their prints are anything to go by, they may have only been the first human climbers to reach the peak of Everest. Nonetheless, the prints set off a fire in both Shipton and swathes of the wider scientific community to mount expeditions to the region to further the search for this yeti. The reason being now that we may be within sight of a close human relative, if not direct ancestor. So Daniel Taylor, Yeti investigator and author of Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery, has a theory for why this search capped the imagination in the way it did. He says, What is this human hunger for these humanoid apparitions? He's convinced it evolved out of the Victorian age when people were circling the world looking for the missing link. So the expeditions had a new drive, But if they were to truly make any scientific discoveries, they had to be very careful to tread the line between the fantastical elements that would win them attention and sponsors and the rigours of science. It was Sidney Dillon Ripley, Yale University ornithologist and regular advisor to those mounting Nepalese expedition, who cautioned wisely, this whole subject is one open to ridicule by scientists that a little detective work on the quiet of this sort would perhaps be the first step. Making bold statements when the image of the Yeti was so freshly associated with Sherpa legends could only push the scientific community away from the burgeoning subject and hinder any attempts at real progress. He was hinting at a kind of sea change in the science community, i.e. the age of the professional scientist, Arguably, an era in which amateur status, and this is a quote from Regal again, held up as a mark of an erudite intellectual and a man of society in the 17th and 18th centuries, was increasingly seen as a liability to professional advancement in the 19th and 20th. There was a tension growing between the amateur and the professional scientists. To put it in simplified terms, mainly boiling down to methodology, and the scientists believing amateur investigators lacked any standardised methods for gathering data or experiment methodology. There was increasingly this idea of the right way of doing science and the right kind of subjects to study scientifically. Professional, i.e. those associated with universities and learning institutes, 
knew that researching the wrong kinds of topics at this time would lead to pronouncements of pseudoscience and lead to ridicule. The searches for the Yeti from this point on would mostly, for this reason, fall to enthusiastic amateurs. But nonetheless, the Shipton photographs attracted the attention, if not enthusiastic attention, of many prominent scientists, including Harvard-based anthropologist Carlton S. Kuhn, an author of multiple controversial books on human origins and his views on race. So pre-World War II, Kuhn's work on race fit comfortably into the old physical anthropology, i.e. grouped the apparent races that make up the human race as a whole based on a certain number of shared physiological characteristics. And although these ideas are debated now, at the time the idea of grouping like body types was a neutral one and led to ideas which are still popular to this day if debunked, like the somatotypes, which are the supposed specific body types associated with certain qualities. So you probably would have heard of them. They're things like endomorph, exomorph, for example. They're supposed to broadly describe different body types. Now, obviously, thoroughly debunked, um, people still talk about them. But at this time, he was participating in this, I said, morally neutral kind of contemporary idea of physical anthropology. At this time, he explicitly rejected any specific definition of race and more used the concept to describe both highly specific groupings of people and continent-spanning racial types. So he avoided the idea of associating races too specifically with any one demographic of person. However, as World War II played out, his theories failed to reconcile with the wider anthropological world's rejection of racial typing and its co-opting as a weapon against the Jewish peoples. As the focus in anthropology circles moved towards ideas of genetics and away from ideas of race... Kuhn's theories in The Races of Europe, The White Race and The New World supported his view of the superiority of the white race and the necessity of supplanting indigenous people for the maximum survival of our species. Now again, I'm going to stop this for a second and say that of course these views are an outlier and not shared by the vast majority of even his contemporaries, let alone modern Yeti researchers. His race theories are widely viewed today as pseudoscience, but nevertheless, his interests and the interests of those like him showed that there was a period in which scientists, explorers and mountaineers were working together in the united goal of learning more about these creatures, admittedly though for their own ends. So Kuhn's belief was that the Yeti and the Sasquatch etc., as expanded on in his 1954 book, The Story of Man, in a chapter on great apes and snowmen, which is what he called them, were relict population of Pleistocene apes. And if scientifically proven, would lend support to his theory that the races, as he saw them, of modern humans could be traced back to separate origins. So again, I quote... For an anthropologist like Kuhn, invested in finding some sort of scientific basis to justify his racism, wild men law offered a compelling narrative, a chance to prove a scientific basis for his white supremacy. In the end, he would never physically make it onto any of the expeditions he would come to talk about, although he was on the cards with some of them. His association with the subject muddied the water with racism and the speculation that he and many of those involved who did go on the expeditions were intelligence officers under the pay of the CIA. Now, I'm just going to chuck that out there. If you would like to look into this, there is a lot more information about their entanglements with the CIA. But I'll just chuck it in to say that that was another motivation that was really muddying the waters, even in this very early stage. However, despite all of these associations, Carlton Kuhn's name and ideas would be woven throughout Yeti and Sasquatch history, and you will hear his name pop up again and again. But from here on out, the large-scale amateur expeditions were to begin in earnest. So the 1954 Daily Mail expedition, mounted by 
you guessed it, the Daily Mail, based out of London, um, was the first. In it, a huge group of scientists, mountaineers and porters headed to the Himalayas for 15 weeks for the sole purpose of hunting a yeti. Accompanied by ornithologists, zoologists, tranquilizer guns and a large cage, the paper's poker-playing foreign correspondent who appeared at base camp wearing a silk cravat, a golfing jacket and a pair of plimsolls, nevertheless returned home empty-handed. Costing an estimated $1.35 million in today's money, they didn't find much, but the stories they brought back, particularly the abundance of tracks found in an upper valley, were enough to inspire some rich and enthusiastic amateurs to follow suit. What they did learn of was the existence of the Pangbosh Buddhist Monastery, said to house many yeti relics. They obtained heavy air quotes, obtained a few hairs from the yeti scalp in the monk's possession and found it to be, although ancient, the pelts of a local goat or possibly bear species. But noted amongst the amateurs that followed in their footsteps was a Texas oil millionaire and enigma, Thomas Baker Slick. A self-professed monster hunter He had been drawn to Asia and the mysteries and legends that he heard about the region since childhood, and he wanted to see the Yeti's hand housed at the same Buddhist temple. In 1956, he visited Nepal as research for his planned expedition to the region, there getting wind of Irishman Peter Byrne's plans to also furnish an expedition to the area. The two met and agreed to work together albeit it was not without tension. But in the spring of 1957, they made a three-week reconnaissance, or abominable snowman trek, as they called it, of the area, and were greatly motivated by the discovery of what appeared to be yeti tracks at about 12,000 feet. The Slick Johnson Nepal Snowman Expedition was mounted in 1958. A large group, accompanied by three hunting dogs, flown in with special permission for the search. They headed back to Pangbosh Monastery. The temple the team travelled to in search of the Yeti Hand was an ancient site with a long and revered history in the Sherpa community. According to Buddhist and Sherpa legend, a lama had settled there in order to devote himself to his faith as a religious recluse. The friendly Yetis who inhabited the area were said to bring him food and water so the monk could continue his meditation and achieve spiritual enlightenment. However, one day when one of these friendly yetis died, the monk kept the scalp as a religious relic and sign of reverence, later building and consecrating a temple around it in 1667. The objects inside were sacred and ancient relics of huge importance to the monks and the Sherpa people in general, but the Slick expedition was determined to analyse them under the guise of scientific discovery, specifically the then-termed Pangbosh Hand. They would be the first to bring back photographs of the fabled item. To this end, Byrne, once he had established in his mind that the custodians of the hand were not going to hand over a finger for analysis, supposedly seized his moment, removing several bones from the Yeti Hand, and substituting them with human bones of dubious origin. This is a kind of legend associated with the Pangbosh hand. Even the people involved say they don't know where he got these mysterious finger bones from, so that's just going to be a mystery that sort of floats around. But the Yeti finger was then supposedly smuggled out of the country by actor James Stewart and wound its way back eventually to a museum in London. Now, this is all very clandestine and very far from, as we were saying, the right way of doing things as we would view it today. By this point, advisors to the Nepal expedition included primatologist William Charles Osman Hill of the relic population theory, the theory that a small group of early hominids somehow survived long after the rest of their species had gone extinct, and perhaps but not necessarily surviving to this day, and also Carlton Kuhn, as well as the fathers of cryptozoology, 
Bernard Huvelmont and Ivan Sanderson. But as you can perhaps gather from the above events, the expedition was somewhat at odds with the bulk of the scientific community. When George Agogino joined the Slick Project, he held a position teaching anthropology and archaeology in South Dakota. And immediately, he was somewhat at odds with Slick himself, who, although he almost entirely funded the project, lacked any specific scientific experience, and Agogino viewed him as more interested in the adventure of it than with the science. Slick and his adventurous team were rather naively preparing to trap or tranquilize a yeti and bring it home, and so made little attempt in Agogino's eyes to make a serious attempt at gathering useful samples and data. Their photographs were not of sufficient quality for analysis. The samples often lacked basic context, such as location and the time of day of collection. They were seemingly only interested in bringing home the big prize, and fell prey to an impulse that has been noted to play cryptozoology to this day. The feeling of those out in the field, their fear of losing their discovery to the scientists back in the lab. But of course, these discoveries mean nothing without the acknowledgement of the scientific community. They were seemingly in a sort of catch-22. But losing touch with the expedition would mean Agogino would lose access to evidence gathered in the field, no matter how poor he viewed it to be. But it increasingly clashed with his ideas of the proper way of doing things. Although x-rays of the stolen bones, for example, managed to confirm conclusively that the bones were either from a wolf or snow leopard, Agogino did not appreciate the method by which these samples were acquired, and more and more he was joined by others who thought this pursuit might be better served by the application of scientists. But eccentric millionaire and prototype Elon Musk, as some have called him, Tom Slick, made one more invaluable contribution to the story of anomalous primates. He extended his search to the Pacific Northwest between 1959 and 1962 and broadened his scope to include Sasquatch or Bigfoot. He was seemingly the last of a dying breed. And this is a quote from Southwest Research Institute, which he founded. One could make the case that the adventurer's penchant for charting the Earth's corners is indeed empathetic if a little wacky and whimsical, and made possible by his lavish wealth. It is unknown where he might have taken this impulse, and where he may have taken the field, should he have not died early, unfortunately, in 1962 in a plane crash. But in 1960 and 1961, Edmund Hillary and American television wildlife personality Marlon Perkins went to Nepal to wrap up the Yeti mystery once and for all. Designed with a dual purpose of studying the long-term effects of working at high altitude, the nine-month-long expedition took along a small team of scientists and trod some very familiar ground, visiting the doctored Yeti hand and scalp, once again asking the monks if they may take this sacred religious relic with them to study. To their surprise, the monks agreed with the proviso that they allow the hand and scalp to be taken to London, only if one of their own accompany it. Then there, the monk cleverly used his fame and attention to raise money for schools back in Nepal. So at least there was seemingly some benefit to this succession of adventurers traipsing around and tampering with sacred objects. But again, despite the interest in the expedition... All analysis came to show once again that neither the hand nor scalp or yeti, hominid or even primate in any way. Snowman search out of the way, the team continued their altitude research. The yeti, figured as just one aspect of the dangers of high altitude, was conclusively debunked. When faced with the universal collapse of the main evidence in support of this creature, the members of my expedition could not, in all conscience, view it as more than a fascinating tale. But although they failed to prove the existence of the Yeti, 
a useful line was drawn between the culture and folklore of the Tibetan and Nepalese people, between the Sherpa belief in the Yeti, and the Yeti as a mysterious hominid that lives in the mountains. The cultural implications of the early Yeti hunting were disentangled somewhat from the contemporary idea of the Yeti, arguably allowing it to be studied in a less colonising way. So the existence of a mountain dwelling bipedal hominid was not entirely discounted, but the Yeti excuse for successions of Americans and Europeans to plunder Nepal and Tibet was weakened, and they would be, for this reason, the last large-scale expedition of the sorts. Nevertheless, the area of Bhutan, most famous for its Yeti sightings and encounters, has found protection from environmental destruction as a protected Yeti habitat. Ultimately, with the Hillary Perkins expedition, the era of big Yeti hunts ended. For a group of amateurs in North America, however, the enthusiasm had just begun. It reads like fantasy to suggest that as late as the 1950s and 60s, groups of wealthy adventurers were donning furs and climbing gear and heading deep into the Himalayas in search of discovering and capturing a live yeti to bring home for study. And in many ways, the modern search for such creatures can be seen as a reaction to this fantasy. They had come in search of a creature that, like a god, occupied the rarefied air between myth and reality, and had seemingly trampled over the spiritual and folkloric elements in an attempt to find at its heart something with which they could put their name in a headline. This appetite for exploring undiscovered lands seemed like a reaction to the bloody wars of the previous decades, and the last spark of this early conquest for discovering new worlds and perpetuating the idea that there were still lands to conquer despite huge worldwide expansion. But for many in Canada and America, it raised the question of why such expeditions were being launched when their own countries had eerily similar legends and their own share of sightings of big, hairy, man-like beings. There were many other tensions and forces at play drawing these adventurers up the mountains, but it was clear that if any real progress was to be made, the effort must abandon the idea of capturing a specimen and start back at grassroots level. And so the Pacific Northwest Sasquatch Expedition was born. And that is where we will be continuing next week. So this instalment turned out to be quite a bit longer than I thought it would, so it was originally going to be one part, but has been split into two. So we're going to be sticking with this subject for a little while, as I find it fascinating, and I owe a not insignificant amount of this fascination to my talks with Bigfoot Club, who sowed an interest in this subject that I knew next to nothing about, and now I'm absolutely fascinated by. I'm loving exploring the fascinating individuals and the changing context around this hunt for proof of anomalous primates so if you are enjoying it too stick around but for now bye